Yes, Mr Costello. Commissioner, the next case study concerns IAG. The witness is Mr Bessel. Could you be good enough to come into the witness box, please, and just remain standing a moment? Well, I first ask whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation. Affirmation, please. Affirm the witness, please. Yes. I solemnly and sincerely I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Uh, your name is Benjamin James Bessel. Yes, it is. And your business address is Level Thirteen Tower Two, Darling Park, Two Hundred One Sussex Street, Sydney. Yes. Uh, and you're the Executive General Manager, Business Distribution and Group Executive within the Australia Division at IAG. Yes. Now, you're attending today pursuant to a summons served by the Commission on you. Yes. Uh, do you have that summons with you in the witness box? I do. I tender the summons to Mr Bessel. The summons to Mr Bessel becomes Exhibit 6.303. Uh, and you've also prepared a witness statement dated 27 August 2018 in respect of rubric 668. Yes. Uh, and that has doc ID WIT 001 0127001. Uh, is the content of that witness statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Uh, I tender Mr Bessel's statement dated 27 August 2018 together with its exhibits. That statement and its exhibits together become Exhibit 6.304. Um, and uh, Mr Bessel, um, Council Assisting may have some questions. Yes, yes Mr Costello. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Bessel, you've worked at IAG for around 25 years. Yes, that's right. And in July of last year, you were appointed Executive General Manager Business Distribution. That's right. And a Group Executive within Australia Division. Yes. Before that, you were the Acting Chief Executive of Commercial Insurance between May 2015 and December 2015. Yes, that's right. And the Chief Executive Australia Business Division from December 2015 to July 2017. Yes. Thank you. You're a member of the IAG <coughs> Group Leadership Team. Yes, I am. How long have you been a member of that team? Uh, since May of 2015. And the group leadership team largely comprises those who report directly to Mr Peter Harmer? That's right. And he's the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of IAG? Yes, he is. And IAG was formed from the demutualisation of NRMA, is that correct? Yes. And IAG is not a brand that's used for selling of insurance products? No, it's not. It's, it's not the, a retail brand. It's not a retail brand. No. It's the owner of a suite of retail brands. Yes. And it's the IAG Limited is the parent company of CGU Insurance. Yes. And it acquired that company in 2003. That's right. And Swan Insurance was owned by CGU. Yes. And became owned by IAG as part of that acquisition. That's correct. <clears throat> and you've been responsible for Swan since May 2015? That's right, yes. CGU, did CGU operate under a devolved business model? Yes, it did. And did Swan operate under a devolved business model? Yes, it did. All right, and we'll come to what that means a little later. IAG has had oversight and monitored risk within Swan since 2015? Yes. Thank you. Now. The purpose of the rubric that was sent to IJ, IAG that you've answered um, was to address questions concerning add-on insurance. Yes, that's right. And add-on insurance is a term used to describe an insurance product that is added on to the sale of another product. Yes. And in the case of Swan, the insurance was added on to the purchase of a car or motorcycle. That's right, yes. And did Swan sell any other types of add-on insurance other than those that attach to the purchase of a car or a motorcycle? No. And the add-on insurance was usually added on to uh, vehicle finance as well? That's right. Typically, yes. And was the premium paid from the uh, vehicle finance amount? 
Yes, on most occasions. Thank you. And the sale occurs at the motor vehicle dealership? Yes, it does. And do you agree that because of the circumstances in which add-on insurance is sold, the primary product, being the vehicle, is typically the main focus of the consumer at that point in time? Yes. And the add-on product is not actively sought by the consumer? I'd, I, don't, I don't know. Do you, would you agree with me that the add-on products are products that are sold to rather than bought by consumers? Yes. yes Thank yes. you. Do you agree that in many circumstances the consumer's decision about whether or not to buy an add-on insurance product is a third order consideration after choosing the vehicle and agreeing on the finance amount and terms? Yes, I accept that, yes. Thank you. And for that reason alone, the consumer's selection of the add-on insurance product might receive less attention than it otherwise would? Yes. Now, I just want to make sure that I understand the regime that this was operating in at the time, that Swan was in this market. There are two important features of the regulatory regime, I think, that permitted add-on insurance um, to be sold in the way that it was. The first was the point of sale exception in the regulations to the National Consumer and Credit Protection Act. You're aware of that? I think I am, yes. That's an exception that's relevant to the sale of consumer credit insurance products. That's right. Yes. Thank you. And the second is the ability of the AFSL holder, in this case Swan, to authorise representatives to provide general advice. That's correct, yes. And did Swan only ever authorise representatives to provide general advice or did it also authorise representatives to provide personal advice? General advice. Thank you. And those two things in combination, those two features of the regulatory regime in combination are important to the add-on insurance market. That's right. Thank you. Did Swan sell products other than add-on insurance? Perhaps I should clarify what, what those products may mean. In, what what add-on might mean? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, perhaps I can put it to you a different way. Did it sell comprehensive insurance? Yes, it did. All right. And um, did it sell any other form of insurance other than the products that's in a remediation program for now? No, not outside not comprehensive. Thank you. Um, so add-on insurance was a very significant part. If I, if I excise from the understanding of add-on insurance comprehensive insurance, yes. when we speak of what S Swan sold, um, everything other than comprehensive insurance was what you would describe as add-on? Yes. Thank you. Um, so add-on insurance was a very significant part of Swan's business yes, then? Yes, it was. Um, and are you aware of how many different types of add-on insurance Swan sold through dealerships? Uh, approximately five products. All right. Well, perhaps we can just go through them. I think you list eight in your statement, but in fairness to you, some may have replaced others. I think there were some variations or replacements, yes. The first is loan protection insurance. Yes. And that's an insurance designed to cover loan repayments in the event of death? Yes. Or perhaps some other events? Yes, there are some other events attached to those policies. And yes. what typically are the other events that that um, would involuntary cover? Involuntary unemployment. Thank you. Um, that would be the other one, yes. Uh, Walkaway insurance was another? Yes. What was that insurance for? Uh, that was insurance uh, where a uh, policyholder could take a, a vehicle back to a dealer and claim the difference between the price of the vehicle and the outstanding loan amount. Um, if, if policy conditions did apply. All right. And then protection plus, plus insurance? Yeah, that, that is what Walkaway turned into um, in approximately February of 2015. There was a name change to the policy and some variations were made to that policy type. And the th first three policy types that we've just spoken about, they're all forms of consumer credit consumer insurance? Consumer credit insurance, yes. Thank you. Um, guaranteed asset protection or gap insurance was another? Yes, it was. And what was that insurance for? So that's insurance to um, ensure effectively the, the gap between the value of a motor vehicle should the vehicle be written off in an accident um, and the difference between that value as it determined by an insurer and the, uh, loan, loan, the outstanding amount on the loan. Thank you. 
there was then purchase price protection insurance. Purchase price protection insurance, that's right. Is that right. a form of GAP or is it different uh, to it's, it's, it's different. Um, it is a policy of insurance that a policyholder can purchase that ensures the difference between the purchase price of the vehicle um, and the amount, the, the, the value of the determinant of the vehicle should the vehicle be written off. So the difference between the two is that the gap insurance is the di is Typically insuring the, the gap between the amount paid out under a comprehensive policy of insurance yes. and the amount outstanding the under the loan. Yes. And with purchase price insurance, it's similar to gap insurance, yes. but it's the difference between the market price of the vehicle and the amount paid to the financier. Purchase price of the vehicle. In the purchase yes. price of the vehicle. Thank you. Um, there's another type of insurance, which is mechanical breakdown insurance. Yes. Um, and that was sold for both cars and for motorcycles yes, on a different right. policy. Yes, that's right. And am I right that that was an extended warranty insurance that covered parts and labour required to repair or replace defective components? Yes, that's right. Thank you. And uh, then there was tyre and rim insurance. Yes. And what was that insurance for? That was to ensure damage to tyres and or the rims of vehicles. And why wouldn't that typically be covered by a comprehensive policy? Uh, many comprehensive policies exclude particular damage um, to that, those parts of the vehicle. All right. Yes. And could a consumer be offered each of those products after buying a car? Uh, yes, they could, except in the consumer credit insurance example, only one of those products could be offered. Only, so uh, only one of the loan protection insurance, the walkaway insurance, yes, or the protection plus yes, insurance. But, but other other products could be could be bundled, if you like, at a point of sale. Yes. Um, and some of those products had multiple options of cover. Yes, they do. Um, and that presented a further complication to the consumer. It, it may have. Yes. <coughs> so, do you think it's fair to say that the number and complexity of the products presented to the consumer, in the various options? that each product, or at least some of them may have had, made having a proper understanding of the key terms or key terms and exclusions of each product difficult? Yes, I think that's, that's fair, yes. Thank you. Now, did Swan have a large share of the add-on insurance market? It did. And it participated in that market through authorised representatives? Yes. Um, and those authorised representatives were uh, motor vehicle or motorcycle dealers. And, and some finance brokers as well, and, and fleet, fleet management companies. That Sorry, last, and the uh, last... Some finance brokers? Yes. And fleet management companies. And fleet management. Yes. Were the finance brokers embedded in a dealership? No. Right. Um, you've exhibited a report to your witness statement. I won't take you to it unless you want me to, but... Uh, from June 2014 that speaks about Swan's market share yes. and where it's deriving its GWP, which I think is gross written premium. Gross written premium, yes. And that document states that, but this is, um, sorry, you haven't exhibited it to your statement, perhaps I should take you to it. It's IAG.508.006.001. Are you familiar with this document? Yes, I am. Um, if we could go to 0077. So this is a part of the document headed channel overview. Yes. And after setting out some general information about SWAN in the second paragraph there, it says the GWP, the gross written premium forecast result for financial year 2014 is 227 million. Yes. And then LYR, what's LYR? 
That might be last year's result. Right, um, to a, thank I, you. I think I'm, yes. 211 million. Uh, Swan has a tradition of delivering strong financial performance, consistently exceeding return on risk-based capital targets. Yes. And then if that could come down, please, and the next paragraph could go up. In that financial year, the dealer sales and distribution delivered 71% of Swan's GWP. So where would the balance have come from? That would have come from the, the finance brokers, um, I, I would think. And the fleet dealers? Yes, that's right, yes. Thank you. Um, it says there the remaining 29% resulted from the direct channel. Are finance brokers and fleet dealers in the direct channel? Oh, I'm s sorry, okay. So, so that would mean um, literally direct outside of a distribution partnership. And it, and it appears that the finance brokers would also, would be included in the 71%, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. That's all right. That um, paragraph can come down. And you can see in the first pie chart there underneath the 71% dealer sales distribution and there's a breakdown of that amount and 49% of it comes from motor dealers. Yes, that's right, yes. And it looks as though, what's that, 7% of it comes from finance brokers? Yes. Where would fleet dealers sit within this? I believe it would be uh, vehicle salary <coughs> packaging as defined here. Vehicle salary I packaging. I believe that's where it would be, yes. Thank you. Commissioner, I tender that document. Uh, Swan Channel Strategy Business Plan. Uh, financial year 14 to financial year 17, IAG 508006073, Exhibit 6.305. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Bessel, do you agree that during the period 2013 to 2016, at least, Swan had a focus on maintaining its market share in this <coughs> segment of the insurance market? Yes, I do. Yes. And you've set out some tables at the end of your witness statement. Um, they don't have totals in them, but I'm just going to put the totals to you and you can tell me if you think they okay. sound right. Um, they're for a 10-year period, and it looks, to me at least, that the number of policies sold through car dealerships over the period was 800, about 846,000 policies. I'd have to have a look at the right. statement, but I'll... Yes. I'll, take it, I'll take you to it if, if we need to. Um, a figure that you might be more familiar with um, is the amount of premiums received. Yes. Now, this is over the 10-year period. Yes. $1.07 billion sound right? Sounds about, yes. And the amount paid out under those policies was almost exactly 10%, yes. about $107 million. The number of claims on the policies was about 80,000, and it looks, as, to me at least, as though about 78% of the claims were accepted. Does that sound like an acceptance rate that would be right to you? I thought it might be a little higher than that, but, but I think around 80 per cent would be got correct. It, if I've got it wrong, no doubt I'll be told in closing submissions. Sure. Um, and won't be the first time. Um, I want to talk to you now about commissions and incentives. Yes. Um, the, the primary way that uh, these types of policies were sold was by authorised reps. Yes, that's right. And um, while there were finance brokers and fleet dealers, we've seen from the pie chart that I just took you to that the bulk of them were car and motorcycle dealers. Yes. And did Swan have a stronger market share in motorcycles as opposed to cars? Yes, for, for a period of time, Swan was the dominant motor, motorcycle dealer uh, insurer, yes. Uh, and it was a higher proportion of market share than in, than in motor vehicles. All right. And um, you engaged authorised representatives by um, an authorised representative agreement, typically? Yes, that's right. And I'll take you to an example of one of those agreements. It's uh, IAG.500.029.1, um, 
Um, this looks like a compliance-like front page, yes, perhaps. An is it? Administration checklist, yes. All right. If we go to the second page, then you'll see what's the real front of the <coughs> agreement. <coughs> Can I take you now to 8746 of that document? Uh, you can see there in clause 2.1, this is where SWAN authorises the dealer to be its representative. Yes. And the authorisation is relevantly in respect of the authorised services. And that's a definition we'll come to later in the document. Um, I'll take you to that definition now. It's at 8770 of that document. See there, Schedule A, Authorised Services, Schedule and Authorised Notice. Underneath that, Authorised Services. The intermediary is authorised by the licensee to carry out advice. Yes. Provide financial product advice, dash, provide general financial product advice only. Yes. Do you know, uh, those two boxes there, are they alternatives? I think you might have said to me earlier that you only ever authorise people to provide general product advice. That's right. That's All my right. understanding, yes. Thank you. Um, you could have authorised them to deal in a financial product. Yes. And then there's the types of dealings set out. Yes. And then there are additional, th additional authorities. Yes. Were these typically given or were they only given on occasion, do you know? I, I don't know. All right. No. And then there are restrictions on authorised services at the end. Yes. Um, and the first one is provide any personal financial product advice. Yes. And is it your understanding that that was always the case? There was always that restriction? Yes, that's right, yes. Thank you. If we could go back then to... Um, oh, sorry, go forward to 8773. You'll be able to see at the page when it comes up the approved products that the this particular authorised representative was approved to deal in. Yes. Um, and at least from the list that you and I just went through, that looks like maybe that's not all of the products. But is the reason that's not, not all of the products because some were only replacements of products over time? Yes, or in some, some occasions uh, an authorised rep representative wouldn't sell all products. Right, but thank you. Um, could we go back to 8750 in that document, please? It'll come up on the screen in a minute, Mr Bessel, and what I'm going to show you here is clause 6.1, which is the first clause in the remuneration and performance section of the agreement. Yes. And you can see that um, the obligation there is that the licensee will pay the intermediary commission or other benefits as set out in this agreement yes. for insurance policies arranged by the intermediary on the licensee's behalf under the agreement in accordance with the rates in the matter set out in the products and commission schedule and this clause six. Yes. Were uh, Swan's dealers paid exclusively by commission? Under this agreement, they were, yes. 
there might have been another agreement where they were paid in a different way or they received funds at least for a different reason? Yes. All right, but under this agreement it's under entirely agreement, commission based. Commission. Thank you. And then if we could go to 8773 of that document, you'll see the products are set out and the relevant rates of commission. This is the page that I took you to the top part of earlier. Yes. And then under the products and commissions table, there are the commissions for each product. Yes. And the commissions vary from product to product. Yes. And for gap insurance, there are five options. Oh, no, sorry, four options. Yes. Um, and that's the only type of add-on insurance where there was an option except for the tyre and rim insurance, <coughs> which depended on additional benefits. Yes, in accordance with this agreement, yes. And was it Swan's ordinary practice to have uh, more than one commission rate for gap insurance? Yes. And did it ordinarily have more than one commission rate for other types of insurance? No. Did it sometimes have additional commission rates for other types of insurance? Yes. Thank you. And why did it have four options for gap insurance at this point in time? So the options to which this agreement refers would be an option within the policy. Within the policy? So, yeah, within the policy. So there would be options um, within a policy and each option attracted a different level of commission. And does that mean each option came with a different level of cover for the insured? Yes. All right. So the, op the option typically, um, ref the, the option related to cover. The extent of, of the cover. cover? Yes. Does that mean, um, and it might be hard for you to answer this, if you can't, don't answer it, but does that mean that under option two here, you would expect there to be a higher level of cover? Yes. And that's why the dealer gets a higher level of commission? Yes. All right. Um, and there's quite a degree of variability there between the commissions payable for the gap insurance from 40% yes. the lowest option up to 51%. Yes. And s s there are variable rates for the other types of commission. Yes. What within the market were the relevant factors that set the rates of commission for the different products? So the consumer credit insurance personal use was capped at 20% in accordance with the, the appropriate um, regulations. The other um, forms of insurance commission as listed here were typically variable based on market conditions. Thank you. If we could go to 8748 of that document. Go to 8748, please. Uh, can you see there, Mr Bessel, Clause 5 is headed Intermediary Obligations? Yes. Um, and there's a requirement in Clause 5.2 for the intermediary to comply with applicable laws? Yes. And then what those laws are is set out underneath in the subparagraphs and includes the Corporations Act, <coughs> the ASIC Act, the Insurance Contracts Act, the General Insurance Code of Practice. Yes. Underneath that, there was an obligation for the intermediary to exercise reasonable care and skill yes. in performing its duties. Um, and then underneath that, an obligation for the intermediary to engage in conduct honestly or fairly, fairly and efficiently. Yes. And then there was um, a clause 5.5, procedures and directions from the licensee. And if the next page could be brought up, please. Um, 
This clause required the, oh, sorry, by this clause, the intermediary agreed to comply with all policies, procedures, guidelines, and any reasonable requirements or directions given to it by SWAN. Yes. Including in relation to the provision of the authorised services by the intermediary. So that is the sale of the add-on insurance products. Yes. Thank you. And then if we could go to 8759. You see clause 22 there, the licensee's right of entry? Yes. And this required um, the intermediary to allow SWAN to enter and inspect any place of business of the intermediary during business hours and other reasonable times to take copies or extracts of any documents that relate to this agreement. Yes. And then in B, with reasonable notice to allow the licensee to conduct an audit of the information. Yes and in C, to cooperate with and provide the licensee with, and any regulatory body, including ASIC or APRA, with any information that the licensee considers may relate to this agreement or the provision, and it goes over the page of the authorised services. Yes. Thank you. Are you aware of that clause ever being enforced by, or the rights under that clause ever being exercised by SWAN? In the, in the normal course of business, representatives would attend both SWAN employees, representatives, would attend the premises of the dealers to meet and discuss with them operational matters. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, of the specific nature of these clauses being invoked, but, but premise visits were regular and information was regularly obtained. Thank you. Commissioner, I attended that document. A corporate authorised representative agreement of 1st August 2015, IAG 500 zero Two nine eight seven four one exhibit six point three zero six. I'll take you to another document now, Mr. Bessel. It's um, IAG dot five hundred dot zero five one dot nine one zero seven. This is an incentive scheme agreement. Yes. And does this look to you at least like a common form of incentive scheme agreement? Yes. Thank you. Um, this one is from July 2013. Yes. And it sets out the basis upon which uh, the a, a dealer would be entitled to additional payments. Payments in payments above amounts that it would be entitled to under the authorised representative agreement we've just been to. I, th I think so. Yes. I mean, I, I've, I've seen. I think I've seen this document that provides more details about the, what that is later on in the document. Yes. But yes. Thank you. Um, if we go to the second page, nine one zero eight. There's a heading incentives. Can you see it? The end of the first paragraph under heading two, it says SWAN has pleasure in off offering the companies the following. Yes. Um, and then there's reference to a marketing subsidy of $150,000 inclusive of GST. Yes. And that's based on the agreed gross written premiums of $1.2 million to be written by the dealer during the 2013-2014 financial year. Yes, that's right and the attainment of a group product mix level of no less than 30% in target period one. Yes. Ignoring target period one for now, what's a group product mix level? So that would be reference to a mixture of different insurance products that would make up the total premium value for that year. You don't want your dealers just selling one type of insurance. You want them selling a mix of products. That, that's right. That's what that's referring to, yes. And is the idea that, they, that the dealer would be selling a, a bundle of products to consumers, is that 
Yes. The idea behind the mixed product. That's right. All right. So most people, the dealer is at least incentivised to sell more than one product to the customer. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then that marketing subsidy is repeated for the following two financial years beneath that. And then if we go over the page to 9109, you can see in subclause D there, there is a performance <coughs> bonus commission. Yes. Calculated and payable annually in arrears in accordance with the relevant table in Schedule A based on the gross written premium written by the companies during each target period. Yes. So it's an additional amount not related to the marketing amount that we've just seen, yes. but um, a bonus on top of the commission that's payable under the authorised representative agreement. Yes, that's right. Thank you. And then underneath that, in sub clause E, there's a product mix bonus. Yes. And that's based on the gross written premiums written over the duration of the target period for the combination of consumer credit insurance and tyre and rim insurance expressed as a percentage of the total premium written by the companies. Yes. Why tyre and rim insurance? I, can only, I don't know because I, I, I don't know the, the basis behind the document, but I would, I would presume that that was a desired product at that point in time that the business felt that it could grow with that particular dealer yes. and wanted to incentivise them accordingly. Speaking generally, was tyre and rim insurance a harder sell? Yes, I'd say so. And so yes. this is incentivising the dealer to do better at selling the harder product? Yes. The consumer credit insurance products might have been a little more easy to get a sale of. Would that be fair? I, I, could, I could say so, yes. Thank I, mean, you. I don't know, but I think, that's, I think it's fair, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, under clause three, that box can come down. There's the eligible products listed. Yes. And then if we could move to um, 9112 of that document, please. And perhaps it can come up with 9113 as well. So this is the schedule that sets out the basis for calculating the performance bonus commission. Yes. And the product mix commission. Yes. Have you seen this sort of a table before? I have. And this was a common arrangement? Not, not. So the, the corporate authorised representative agreement was a minimum standard agreement, if you like, for all authorised representatives. Not every authorised representative was issued with an incentive agreement. Right. But for those that were, this was a common form of, of arrangement. Thank you. Do you have any idea of the percentage of dealers that would have come under a performance incentive agreement? I don't, but I, I do know, though, of the percentage of total payments made. To dealers? Re relative to uh, a standard commission versus the other commissions that are outlined here, but I don't know a percentage of dealers. D do you know... I want to make sure I understand you. Do yes. You know of the payments made by Swan to dealers, what percentage of the payments were made under the standard commission arrangement and what percentage were made under an incentive arrangement? I, I know of the percentage, yes. Yes, and yes. what is the percentage? It was approximately 70% of payments made to dealers would fall under the standard corporate authorised representative agreement, which was the agreement we went through early with the, yes. those commission tables, um, and approximately 30% would come from agreements such as this. Thank you. Uh, and what was the basis upon which somebody would be offered an incentive agreement? My understanding was that these were offered to, to dealers um, that we felt could grow, um, were possibly a new client of the business, so there was an incentive there for them to, um, to grow and be incentivised for growing with Swan. Um, and I also think there was a, uh, an, uh, an element of market forces here where in a competitive market these types of agreements were not uncommon 
and if we were to keep a keep a a business or an authorised representative or obtain one, these are, these agreements would need to be put in place. I see. Um, now, in terms of the two tables here, the first one offers a percentage of gross written premium in excess of $1 million in the target period. Yes. Um, and differential bonuses depending on the extent of the selling. Yes. And the second table, again, differential bonuses based on the extent of the selling, but in set sums. Yes. And that was the standard form that was used by SWAN for these incentive agreements. The, the agreements may vary in type, but, but it would be laid out on a format such as this, but there may be variances to product, for example, depending on the, the arrangements with the particular yes. authorised representative. Thank you. Commissioner, I tender that document. Letter of 2 July 13, uh, dash incentive scheme agreement, IAG 500 exhibit 6.307. We now please go to IAG.500.117.6772. While that's coming up, um, Mr. Bezel, the because such a heavy percentage of Swan sales was conducted through authorised representatives. Swan was heavily reliant on the performance of its dealers to maintain its market share. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Swan would incentivise some of its dealers? Yes. Now, this document is entitled Swan Risk Profile, and it's been conducted as at the 13th of October 2014. Have you seen this type of document before? I have. And if we could move to perhaps to 6776 of the document. I asked you earlier whether or not in the period 2013 to 2016 Swan was uh, keen to maintain its market share, and you agreed with me, I think, yes. that it was. And we can see here that in this, um, in this risk profile, there's a risk described in the first column on the left uh, as being a risk that competitors or new entrants successfully attack our dealer intermediated market for strategic or profit reasons resulting in reduced market share. Yes. That was seen to be a risk. Yes. Um, and the inherent impact or likelihood of the risk was got a red rating, major, almost certain, extreme. Yes. Um, and then there's some of the context set out there in the uh, first column, which is somebody dreaming up ways that this could come to be. I'm not sure if they were dreaming them up, but well, there, there would be some fact-based. That's right. Consi considering ways that this risk might yes. manifest itself in a real form. Yes. And they, whoever did this document then points to existing controls yes. to try and prevent that happening. And the first control was commission arrangements. Yes. Um, the second was leveraging SWAN network and IAG buying power. And the third was the ignition incentive program to provide more benefits, yes. reviewed and reinvigorated. Yes. The fourth was continued focus to improve our value proposition to distributors through introduction of additional products and services and the development of strong relationships. Yes. And then I'll just let you read the next yes. bullet points in that column. Yes. There's nothing in that column that is focused upon the consumer, is there? No, there's not. Um, and part of the reason for that is that Swan viewed its customer, in effect, as being the dealer. Effectively, yes, that's, that's right. It was the dealer that uh, was 
the dealer was the person that insurance companies were competing for. Yes. Because that was the distribution channel for the product. That's right. And the dealers then had customers, which were the people they were selling cars to. Yes. And add on insurance. But Swan's focus was on maintaining its dealer network and keeping its dealers happy because that was how it maintained its market share. That's right. And there's reference here to the Ignition Incentive Program, which I'll take you to soon. But was that a program that had been running within Swan for some time at the date of this document? This is October 2014. I, I don't know how long that program was running for, but I, I'm aware it was running um, for a number of years, but I don't know how long for how long it was running. Um, and, um. and for context, I, I started looking after this business from May of 2015. Yes. So no, I appreciate I'm that. Somewhat limited my knowledge there, but I have I have seen documents related to the Ignition program. Thank you. Um, if we could go over the page to six seven seven seven, please. There's another risk identified there, number three, political legislative <coughs> regulatory risks, e.g. CCI, that's consumer credit insurance. Yes. Add-on insurance intermediated distribution methods. Yes. That's the risk, the potential causes for the risk are regulator government reviews. Yes. Changes to interpret to legal interpretation by legal industry or in sorry, by legal or industry body. Yes. Ongoing CCI review by ASIC. ASIC is currently reviewing the way financiers sell CCI insurance. Yes. Lack of distinction between ASIC and ACCC. Do you understand what that means? I don't understand what that means. Thank you. And then tyre and rim add-on products review by <coughs> ASIC. Yes. So whoever prepared this document was aware that, that there were risks emerging from the regulator, regulator at least, yes, and had rated the impact of that as major, likely critical, but then put underneath that a question mark to discuss. Yes. Um, and that came to be accurate in that this, this risk did manifest, in yes. that the regulator continued to pay attention to this part of the market. Yes. Um, in an even more considered and intense way than it had to the to this point in 2014. Do you agree with that? Yes, it did. Thank and you. Yes. Um, Commissioner, I tend to that document. It's one risk profile conducted 13 October 2014, IAG 500, 1176772, exhibit 6.308. Um, Mr. Bezel, I said I'd take you to the Swan Ignition <clears throat> program, which I might do now. Could I take you please to IAG.500.051.5739? This, um, this is a manual for the program. Yes. Uh, it's titled an administrator's manual. Who's the administrator of the program? Swan Insurance. Right, so this is an internal Swan document. It's not a document for the dealers. It's a it, no. It's an internal document. All right. And could I take you please to point five seven four four? While that's coming up, could you just explain in general terms what the ignition program was? Yes. So it was a program for employees of authorised representatives um, that effectively provided an employee. Uh, a point system on the successful sale of an insurance policy. And that might um, draw out a distinction that I hadn't um, drawn from you before. The authorised representative agreements, are they typically with the principal of the dealer group? In yes, effect? the corporate entity. And the commission payable is payable to the corporate entity. Yes. Um, and this ignition program is a way of incentivising the employees of the authorised representative. That's right. And we can see here under the heading, understand the ignition incentives program, it says it's an online incentive program. How was it online? Um, sorry. Sorry, underneath the heading understanding the oh, yes. ignition, yes. ignition incentive program. Yes, okay, thank you. It says it's an online incentive program. 
Yes, so I think this document outlines uh, the program. So effectively, uh, an employee of an authorised representative could, uh, once they were certified to provide general advice and sell these products, would be eligible to participate in, a, in, in this program. Uh, upon a, the sale of a policy, they would be rewarded points, and those points could be redeemed via access through a website, and then a catalogue of um, goods could be selected from through which they could redeem their points. All right. And it says there in bold, one ignition... Oh, sorry, on ignition, one point equals one dollar. Yes. Um, and what ha would happen under the program is that a number of points would be attributable to the sale of a particular product. Yes. And then each one of those points was a dollar, and that dollar was redeemable for a, for, for a selection of products that was available on the Ignition website that Swan operated. Y yes, to, to an equivalent value, yes. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, and this program was still running when you took charge of Swan? Yes, it was. And if that box could just come down for a moment or if we could zoom back out, I asked you earlier how long the program had been running for and you weren't quite sure. Yes. Um, I think you said for some time. You'll see that yes. in the very first line of that document, 2004. 2004, Does that yes. sound right to you? Yes. Thank you. Was this the central way that Swan incentivised employees of dealer groups? Yes. Was there any other way that it did it? There would be... Th this, is the, this would be the... Um, I would say this was the most commonly used incentive system throughout the network of ARs, authorised representatives, I'm sorry. Um, from time to time, we were... The Swan business would hold um, events, for example, um, corporate hospitality, for example, but in a, in a formalised basis, this is, the, this is the incentive arrangement that was uh, employed with the authorised representative um, staff, yes. Thank you. The Commissioner, I tender that document. Ignition Incentive Program Administrator's van Manual, version 4, December 14, IAG 500 Exhibit 6.309. Mr Bessel, could I now take you to uh, um, another document, IAG.500.051.5731, while that's coming up, does Swan, to the extent, did Swan, to the extent it was able to, seek to understand what incentive programs its competitors ran? I believe so, yes. Do you know whether or not Swan, some of Swan's competitors had similar incentive programs for the staff of authorised representatives? I, I, I can't say that I do. I'm aware of similar... In, I'm aware of incentive programs uh, in the market, generally speaking, but I, I, I can't say that I know the details of those programs. Are you aware of incentive programs in the market, generally, for the employees of dealers? Yes, yes. But so, I don't know what they are. But. Right. But Swan wasn't... To your, to your knowledge, Swan wasn't the only entity that was seeking to incentivise the employees of dealers? No, I don't believe so. Thank you. Um, have you seen this document before? I have. And is this a document that came out in a similar form reasonably regularly from yeah. Swan? Uh, yes, it did. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me at least that this document is a short-term bonus with, oh, within the ignition program? Yes, it is. To try and give an additional incentive over the ordinary ignition incentive to the dealer group staff? Yes, for, for an agreed period of time. Yes. yes, and could you just explain how this particular program worked? Yes, so this is a short-term incentive that appears to have been issued... I'm not sure if it was issued to a particular dealer group or, or just in general. Um, but it's for a period of time, 3rd of February to Wednesday, the 30th of April, 2014. And it's effectively um, providing more, more points than would normally be the case under the ignition program for a salesperson should they obtain a um, 
It's referred to here as three products written in a single transaction. So this is if you sell a bundle of three products, you get an additional 50 points? Yes. That's on top of the points that you would have got? Yes. And if you manage to get four in a bundle, you get 75 points? Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, I'm an sorry. An yes, additional I'm 75? Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and then there's an explanation in the box underneath that about how that might work. Yes. And these ignition points, like the ones we've just seen from the manual I took you to, were worth the equivalent of a dollar? Yes. Thank you. And how often would this type of multi-policy incentive be run? I don't know. I don't know the frequency. I, I, could, I can't say. Do you know whether they were typically run just for a specific dealer or whether they were run more generally than that? I don't know. All right. Um, are you aware of whether Swan ran these sorts of multi-policy incentives during your time in charge of Swan yes, after I, May 2015? Yes, I believe they did. And yes. who would authorise them in that case, at uh, the, that period of time, rather? So my understanding would be that the, uh, the sales manager would authorise... Uh, and typically something of this nature would need to get approved depending on the, the dollar value or the potential dollar value of, of, the, of the program. Approved by? A approved by the, the general manager of that business. Is that, would that have relevantly been you at that point? No. No, no. somebody that reported to you? Uh, or someone, or so, reported to someone who reported to me. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I won't take you to it, but unless you want me to, but there's another one of these documents in the court book that's for the period the 24th of May 2016 to the 30th of June 2016, yes. and that would have been in the period where you had ultimate responsibility yes, that's right. for SWAN. Yes. Thank you. Um, I tender that document, Commissioner. Ignition supercharged multi-policy incentive February to April 2014, IAG 500-051-5697, Exhibit 6.310. Mr Bessel, are you aware that at all relevant times SWAN was obliged to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that may arise from the sale of its products? Yes. And am I right in saying that one process SWAN had in place to manage potential conflicts of interest was the training program that it put its authorised representatives through? Yes. And could you tell us something about that training program? Was it necessary for the authorised dealer to be trained before entering into the agreement? Th that's correct. And was it necessary for the authorised dealer's staff to be trained? Yes, so, yes, that's right, yes. Um, and once the training had happened, is it also the case that dealers and perhaps their employees were sometimes required to complete an electronic questionnaire? Yes, that's right. And how often did that need to be undertaken? So the general insurance training was a prerequisite to, for, a, for a salesperson to have access to be able to sell the product. Um, so that was, that was general insurance. And that, that, that training package was, uh, was registered with ASIC. There'd also be some privacy and complaints handling and so on packaged up with that. Um, minimum training requirement, and that was that had to be completed by the salesperson before they could sell the product. After that, there was the electronic management questionnaire that I think you're referring to. Yes, thank you. Um, and that would be sent to dealers uh, on a regular basis. I'm not sure of the frequency of, of that. Um, and that would be an electronic format that would be overseen by the risk and compliance team within SWAN. And were they the two processes that SWAN had in place to manage potential conflicts of interest? They, they would be, I would say yes, yes. Was there any other process in place that you can think of? There was the ability for, um, if, a, if a conflict of interest had been observed by a staff member or a member of an authorised representative, they could lodge or log a, um, was, was referred to as a compliance mailbox, so matters could be referred and logged into that um, compliance mailbox and that would be reviewed also by the compliance manager within the SWAN business. Thank you. Do you agree that SWAN's remuneration and incentive arrangements, including in the documents that I've taken you to now, which are representative, I think, of what was going on in the relevant 
time period that we're talking about, do you agree that those arrangements incentivised sales alone? I would say, I wouldn't say alone, I would say the predominant motivation or incentive was sales. It was exclusively the motivation, wasn't it? Sales incentive programs, yes, but... Uh, the entire point of them was to, in was to incentivise sales. Yes, that's, tr that's true, yes. And there was no intention of incentivising any other conduct. No, that's right. Thank that's you. That's right. They didn't seek to incentivise compliance with the law. No, not on an incentive basis. My, my view would be that would be um, inherent, though, with, the, with a corporate, corporate authorised representative agreement. The agreement, the, some of the clauses that I took you to before, imposed an obligation on the dealer to comply with the law. That's right. That yes. was an obligation that sat there from the moment they signed the agreement. That, that's right. And um, is it your evidence that there was an expectation that that would be those obligations would be met? Yes. Uh, and do you think that there was any tension between the type of incentive arrangements that Swan was offering and compliance with the law generally? I don't believe there was tension between compliance with the law, but I, I think in a sales environment where, where high incentives are evident, uh, it, it's an environment that needs to be, needs to be considered. Do you think that um, these incentive programs incentivised sales that were inappropriate? On occasions that did occur, yes. Are you, are you aware that most new car dealerships have very thin margins on their car sales? Yes. And for that reason, they rely heavily on sales of other products for their profitability? Yes, that's right. One of the other products might be parts and servicing? Yes. Um, and another is add-on insurance products? That's right. Do you think that heavily incentivising a business that is heavily reliant on the income from a particular product line is likely to result, more likely to result in inappropriate sales? I think, I think we've seen evidence of that. And if I look back on what I've observed and also what we have um, since agreed with ASIC, in the form of a re resolution program, oh, yes, oh, we've seen examples of that. You accept that Swan's authorised representatives engaged in sales practices where consumers were sold products that were not appropriate to the consumer? O on occasions, yes, that did occur. Thank you. Commissioner, I see the time. Yes, how long do you expect to need with Mr Bessel? Do you expect think? at least an hour. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr Bessel, but we're going to have to bring you back uh, tomorrow. Uh, at what time, Mr Costello? Uh, Commissioner, 9.30 if we can, but... 9.30 it is then. Uh, if we, you could be good enough, Mr Bessel, to be back in time to begin at 9.30 tomorrow morning. We'll adjourn until that time. Yes, Mr Costello. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr Bessel, you'll recall that when we finished yesterday, we had been um, having a discussion about remuneration of dealers and dealer employees. Yes. And um, we had had some discussion about the ignition program. Yes. Um, and about how dealers are remunerated under the authorised representative agreements and a copy of one of those agreements I'd taken you to. Yes. Um, you're aware that under the National Credit Code there is a cap for commissions on consumer credit insurance? Yes, I am. And that caps 20% of the amount of the premium? Yes, that's right. And you're also aware that IAG notified the Commission on the 29th of June this year that Swan made payments to 34 authorised representatives which may have exceeded the 20% cap? Yes, I'm aware of that. Um, 
Are you familiar with the letter that I, I, AG sent? I have seen the letter. Thank you. Um, I'll take you to it. It's RCD.001.0015. Uh, dot double zero six eight. See there in the second paragraph, IAG informed the Commission by way of supplementary notification that it had identified payments made by a former AFSL holding entity, which was Swan, to 34 of its authorised representatives, which may have exceeded the cap. Yes. Um, you know, at that point, specifically identified 153 payments, totalling approximately $6.792 million. Yes. Of which IAG believed at least $5.985 million related to consumer credit insurance products. Yes. All right. Um, how did this breach happen? So my understanding was that as part of the incentive agreements that we discussed yesterday outside of the standard commission in, in the standard corporate authorisation agreements, um, where some incentive payments can be made there is a, an incentive type which is a product mix bonus. We talked about that yesterday, where there's a mix of or blend of products. Um, my understanding in this case is that although on a transactional basis the personal use consumer credit insurance was capped at 20 per cent, when an aggre aggregate premium view was taken and an, effectively an additional um, commission was paid, some of the consumer credit insurance premium value may have been included in an overall number to which a further commission was applied. So it related exclusively to the product mix bonus, did it? That's, what, that's my understanding, yes. And it didn't have any relationship to the ignition program? No, I don't believe so. Good. Thank you. Um, that document can come down. Um, Mr Bezzel, in your statement you outline... Oh, I should tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, letter IAG to the Commission 29 June 18 RCD 0001005 becomes Exhibit 6.311. Um, in your statement, Mr Bezel, you outline the systems that Swan had in place to oversee and monitor the conduct of authorised representatives. Yes. Um, I'm going to take you to a reasonably recent report that IAG produced. It's Document ID is IAG.503.002.3.2.2.2. You might recall that yesterday um, I asked you some questions about oversight systems. Yes. Um, and you pointed to the training program that IAG had. Yes. Um, and the electronic questionnaire. Yes. Um, and I had taken you to some provisions in the authorised representative agreement that gave Swan a suite of rights in respect of dealers. Yes. Um, and you weren't able to say whether those rights had ever actually been exercised. I think this was this in relation to attendance at premise. Yes. Uh, I, th I said that I believe that I was aware that on many occasions staff of Swan attended dealerships, but I. I couldn't recall if... Well, I didn't know if particular provisions of that agreement had been invoked. Yes, thank you. Um, have you seen this document before? Yes, I have. Thank you. Um, this was prepared in... Um, or it's dated the 9th of January 2017, but it relates to... It's a backward-looking document... Yes. ..to uh, Swan's processes. Yes. Um, could we please go to the second page of that document, dot... 3838. This was this document was prepared by the Chief Risk Office, is that right? Uh, I believe so, yes. I think there were two representatives that prepared this report, yes. Thank you. Um, you can see there the background to the report is ASIC's release of of this report is a background of uh, is ASIC's release of report 470 yes. on buying add-on insurance yes and then a subsequent um, strategic review in July 2015 yes and then you can see under the heading conclusion there's some comment about 
the decrease in the risk because of the sale. Yes. And then the second paragraph says, historically Swan has maintained a light touch in the approach to the monitoring of authorised representatives, a considered decision in part due to the prioritisation of scarce resources. Do you agree with that observation? My observations are that, um, and this report was, as you say, this was compiled after we sold the motor vehicle dealership business in August of, of the previous year. Yes. Um, and I think, I think the, the view here of light touch, um, I, th I think that would be, based on what I have also seen, I, I think that would be an appropriate assessment. Thank you goes on to say, however, the risk profile associated with third party distribution continues to change, particularly in relation to conduct risk, and there is increasing scrutiny from the regulators. The oversight and assurance activity within SWAN has not yet responded to this changing level of risk. Yes. You agree with that? Yes, I think, yes, I do, yes. You. you can see the recommendations are made, and the second one is introduce a program of face-to-face -face compliance reviews across the authorised representative pool using a risk-based sampling approach? Yes. That's not something that was in place at the time this report was written? No, it's not. Thank you. If we could move to the next page, 3839. See under the heading SWAN compliance guidelines. Yes. Um, I wanted to specifically draw your attention to the second triangle, which looks to be the third point. Yes. There is an opportunity to include more detail in the guideline documents around compliance breach reporting in a framework of a more robust monitoring model. The authorised representatives currently are not actively recording potential breaches and therefore SWAN has no oversight on any issues that may be occurring. Promoting the importance of logging all potential breaches is required. This is a useful tool to identify trends, gaps and weaknesses within the business. Yes. Do you agree that SWAN's authorised representatives did not actively record potential breaches? This report is, is, is the only reference that I have seen in relation to that matter. And I, I did note when I saw this report in preparation of, um, of um, attending yesterday that, that um, management agreed in principle with the findings of this report at the time. Yes. Um, I, so I, I would also agree with that. Thank you. Um, if, if I could mention for context, um, at this stage we had, we had sold the motor vehicle dealership business in August of 2016. We were still managing the motorcycle dealership business. Um, that business was quite different in its makeup of add-on and, and so on. Um, but I accept the point and the observation made here. Yes. For so long as Swan owned the motor vehicle distribution business, yes. this report speaks to the compliance and risk processes that Swan had in place. I'm not sure if that is, is a view of, for the entire period. Um, I'm not sure if the document refers to the, to the scope of the review. No, I, d I don't think it does, and that's a fair point. It, it might not be for the entirety of Swan's ownership, but at least in the latter years of it, Swan's yes. ownership of the motor vehicle, vehicle distribution. Yes. Thank yes. you. Um, if that box could come down, please. There's then a heading training, and can you see the last point under that heading? No ongoing monitoring in place to ensure required refresher training is completed and up to date. Yes. So one of the we had agreed yesterday that one of the processes Swan had in place to try and ensure compliance was its training program. Yes. But it was the case that there wasn't any monitoring in place to ensure that refresher training was completed. Yes. Thank you. And then if we could go over the page three eight four zero. See the heading there is monitoring and the triangle in the middle of the page is no face-to-face -face audits are carried out in relation to compliance with the SWAN AR guidelines. Yes. And then there's reference to the questionnaire that you and I had spoken of yesterday. Yes. 
Um, the questionnaire is distributed to authorised representatives as a means of capturing their compliance knowledge levels. Yes. The questionnaire is limited in the level of detail it captures and completeness of responses cannot be evidenced. Yes. Follow-up actions in response to the questionnaire are minimal. Yes. The light touch approach to monitoring is reactive. Behavioural issues are only identified when a customer complaint is received. A more proactive face-to-face -face approach could preempt poor service, reduce the workload in complaints management and provide the better customer experience in line with IAG priorities. Yes, see that. And it then says in the emboldened paragraph, it is appreciated that face-to-face -face reviews of all ARs is not cost effective. A risk-based sample approach would provide a greater level of assurance and complement the responses received through the questionnaire. A similar practice is used successfully within NAS insurance brokers, a subsidiary of CGU. I see that. Given all of that, oh, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Oversight of Swan, authorised representatives, report 9 January 17, IAG 503-002-3837, exhibit 6.312. Uh, Mr. Bessel, given all that's been said in that report, as at January 2017, and for some period of time before that, SWAN did not have adequate processes in place to ensure that its representatives were complying with relevant financial services law, did it? No, I believe that I believe that it did. You think that it did? Yes. What processes are you calling to your mind to draw that conclusion? The processes that I outlined. Uh, yesterday, in relation to uh, general general training um, and the follow-up processes that were used through the electronic questionnaire and so on. And you think those two things in combination were sufficient? Yes. Notwithstanding that there was no auditing going on, there was no proper reporting of breaches by authorised representatives. So my, my view, my view on this report and um, statements I've made previously is that I think that the summary here of light touch would be a fair, fair assessment, but I believe there's a distinction between light touch and and non-compliance. Well, my question to you was whether or not Swan had adequate processes in yes. place, and you think a light touch approach to authorised representatives is adequate? I think we could have been more proactive, but I think that would have been the minimum requirement. Do you think that if you're more proactive, Swan might not be in the position that it's now in of having to remediate in excess of $30 million? I, I, I can't, say, can't say for sure, but I think, uh, and we've acknowledged that we could have been more proactive, and I think we, what we've seen transpire in the last year or so uh, through the remediation process, um, that would reflect on occasions where a more proactive approach could have could have been more beneficial do to you the consumers. Think, pardon me. Sorry. Do you think the Chief Risk Office were being overzealous in what they recommended in this report? No, I don't. But you don't think what they were recommended reflected what was required? Do you think it reflected something over and above what the law required? No, I think, no, I th I th I think their observations are, are a fair assessment from what, I, from what I have also observed. Do you think, though, that you could have adequate processes in place to ensure that representatives are complying with financial services law where you don't do any auditing of them? Well, no, that would, not, that, that would not be the case if there were no audits done. And there were no audits done, were there? No, I believe there were audits done. How often were the audits done? I don't know. Um, I, the last part of that document I took you to started no face-to-face -face audits are carried out? Yes. So how were audits carried out? My understanding was they were undertaken electronically. Is this a reference to the questionnaire? Yes. But the questionnaire is not an audit? No. So no audits were carried out? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But to I your, accept... Sorry. Well, let me put it to you a different way. To your knowledge, no audits were carried out? That's right. To your knowledge, what pro the processes that SWAN had in place to comp ensure that its authorised representatives were complying with financial services law with some initial training... Yes and then an electronic questionnaire? Yes. And the electronic questionnaire was not actively monitored? No, it was monitored. The, there was no ongoing monitoring to ensure that training was refreshed? 
Is that is that in reference to the report here? Do you want me to take you back to it? If I, if, if you could. Could we go Thank to three eight three nine of that document, please? Can you see under training? The last point, no ongoing monitoring in place to ensure required refresher training is completed? Yes. And you appreciate that from time to time financial services law changes? Yes. And SWAN had no ongoing monitoring in place to ensure that required refresher training is completed and updated? Yes. It didn't carry out any face-to-face -face audits? No, I, I accept the, the points raised in this report. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not, I'm not aware of the scope and the time that this report was considered, so how far back the, the review may have, may have gone. Um, so I accept... It seems at a minimum to... It, it picks up at least one document from March 2013. Yes. So it seems to be considering at least back to that point in time. And for so far as we are concerned for the purposes of this case study, 2013 is probably about the start of the timeline. OK. You agree with that? that yes, that's when um, that on insurance was also being, being discussed. Quite. So if I can perhaps put my initial question to you again, but for a more confined period, are you prepared to accept that between 2013 and January 2017, SWAN did not have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that its authorised representatives complied with financial services law? Um, no, I, I don't th think I'm in a position to agree with that, no. And I just don't want to repeat this, but I want to make sure that I understand the basis for your answer. The basis for your answer is that the initial training that was required of dealers... Yes. ..combined with the electronic questionnaire... Yes. ..were sufficient for SWAN to discharge that obligation. So there was an obligation also to have ongoing monitoring, which I think we're referring to here. Um, my, my, my view to your question, I, th I think my observation is that, that that could be a legal, more of a legal question, and I'm not sure if I'm, I can answer that question w with the full knowledge of, of Well, you the certainly law. can't answer it definitively, but no. you can answer it from a management perspective at least. Yes. You were in charge of this business ultimately for a period of time. Yes, I was. And SWAN had a legal obligation to ensure it had adequate arrangements in place. Yes, I accept that. SWAN had how many authorised representatives? At its peak, 3,000. 3,000 authorised representatives around the country? Yes. That were selling financial products? Yes. And the financial products had various complications to them? Yes. And they were sold in a sales environment where the person had already been sold a car? Yes. And probably a finance package, and was now being offered one, of, one or more of six different products? Yes. And the authorised representative had its own employees? Yes. The authorised representative was incentivised by commission? Yes. And the authorised representative's employees were personally incentivised by the ignition program? Uh, not all, but, but many, but some, yes. And yes. some, at various points in time, were further incentivised by a supercharged ignition program? Yes. And there were all manner of obligations that those authorised representatives had to the consumers? Yes. And there are all, sort, all manner of uh, obligations that uh, SWAN was responsible for ensuring that its authorised representatives complied with. Yes. And SWAN had no real understanding on a day-to-day -day basis what those authorised representatives were saying to consumers, did it? I, I don't know if that's correct, no. The, uh, well, how would you know? The, the monitoring of, of the dealers at the compliance monitoring and training and so on? Well, the training won't tell you what they're saying. The training will tell them what they're supposed to say. Do you accept that? Yes, I do. So if there was an authorised representative in a dealership in suburban Melbourne yes. that was making representations to a consumer about a product that was plain wrong, yes. the only way Swan would ever know is if there was a complaint from the consumer. That's right, yes. And do you think that's adequate? I, no, I don't. I think I think we should have been more proactive in how we how we manage the the AR networks. I mean, it's just not arguable, is it, that Swan had in place adequate arrangements in respect of its authorised representatives complying with financial services law. That's the whole tenor of this report. 
I, I accept the report, but to the to the point I raised earlier, I'm not sure what the where the standard may drop below the requirements. My, my view would be that that that's perhaps more of a legal matter. It's my opinion. Sorry. Sorry. Continue. I, was say, I, I accept though what the report says, so I'm not. Well, in your capacity as the person that was running the business, did you feel comfortable with the arrangements that were in place in respect of authorised representatives? Did you feel you had sufficient visibility of what was going on out in the marketplace? I hadn't seen this report before. No. So on reading this report in preparation, um, I was disappointed to see what, what, what this report said. And it might not have occurred to you at the time, in fairness, but having now had the benefit of the Chief Risk Office assessing the functions, yes. does it strike you that if you were running a business today yes. that had that level of oversight of its authorised representatives that you'd be comfortable with it? No. And do you think that that would be a sufficient arrangement to monitor authorised representatives in a business today? No. And do you think there's any reason why it would have been uh, appropriate in 2013? Or no. 2014? No. Or 2015? No. Or 2016? No. Thank you. And it's also the case, isn't it, in particular because of the failure of authorised representatives to breach report, that SWAN didn't have in place at that period of time adequate risk management systems? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, now, as became apparent, serious issues emerged with the add-on insurance products and the add-on insurance market. Yes. Um, is it fair to say that those difficulties came in at least two forms? One was difficulties with the products themselves and how they'd been designed. Yes. And the second was difficulties with the market and the way the products were sold. Yes. And since I think I'm right to say late 2013, IAG was aware that ASIC was looking into this market generally, starting, I think, with consumer credit insurance products. Uh, yes. And then eventually broadening its gaze to all add-on products sold through motor dealers. Yes. In, uh, in 2013, ASIC issued a, um, a report into um, add-on insurance, or, or indicated they were um, going to look into that in more detail. All right. In um, June 2015, IAG Group Corporate Affairs prepared a memorandum um, and they identified concerns with the design of some of the add-on products and the sales practices. The add-on products they were concerned with for the purpose of this report was the consumer credit insurance products. Yes. Um, and that memorandum was summarised in an email, and you've exhibited the email to your statement, so I might just take you to it. It's Exhibit 18 to your statement, which is IAG.502.002.2015. If we could... Go to the second page of that document, 0718. Uh, this is an email from Jane Anderson to Andy Cornish. Um, it's Jane Anderson's job description is set out there, Group General Manager, Corporate Affairs. She's within IAG, not SWAN. Yes. And what was Mr Cornish's role? At the time, um, Mr Cornish was the Chief Executive Officer of um, our Consumer Division. And for, for context, if I may, at, at that point in time, we effectively in Australia had two divisions, an intermediated division, which effectively sold product through third parties, intermediaries, such as insurance brokers. Swan was attached to that division, which, and that was the division that I was the chief executive of. And Andy Cornish was the chief executive of the other division within Australia, which was effectively the direct business division. That division, however, included the financial institutions distribution arm that sold consumer credit insurance. Thank you. So both divisions were selling forms of consumer yes, credit insurance? that's right. Thank you. And um, Ms Anderson says to Mr Cornish, as discussed, here's the draft paper on consumer credit insurance. The paper is a work in progress and we continue to talk to people in our business that are responsible for CCI and we're also waiting to hear the outcome of ASIC's review of add-on insurance. Yes. Essentially, we're saying that we think an emerging risk to our business is the possible increase in regulations surrounding the sale of CCI. Yes. I also think 
from any regulatory response, we need to think about the reputational impact of being associated with a product that might not always provide a great outcome for our customers. Yes. On the other hand, as the paper suggests, CCI does on some occasions help customers out in a time of need. Yes. And do you recall the memorandum, the draft paper that she's referring to there? I, I have seen it. Um, Would you like me to show it to yes, you? Yes, that would be good. Yes, um, it's Exhibit 19 to your statement, which is IAG.502.002.0719. See it's prepared by Group Corporate Affairs, June 2015 at the top. Yes. And the, uh, the purpose of the memo is to determine whether there's a need for support from the policy and government team through targeted government advocacy and persuasive policy positions to ensure fav outcomes favourable to IAG's business interests. Yes. And it then goes on to talk about the background and in particular how there had been um, significant investigations into consumer credit insurance in Europe. Yes. And I think it's fair to say that those investigations were at least one of the triggers for ASIC investigating in Australia. Yes. And then there is um, quite a bit of discussion in this memo about um, different aspects of consumer credit insurance. and. Do you recall, it, it notes some product design issues. I don't want to take you specifically to them, but it, it, it notes that there are some product design yes. issues. It notes that there are conflicts in the remuneration practices for the sale of the products. And it suggests that what is required is an AIG-wide approach to the issue rather than a business-by-business -business approach. I, I, IAG, yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. Thank you. Um, on the 11th of June 2015, you emailed Stuart Chapman um, I'll, you've exhibited that to your statement as well. It's Exhibit 1, which is IAG.500.100.5078. Yes. And in the email, which you'll see when it comes up, you are seeking to understand any dialogue Swan may have had with any regulators over the last 12 to 18 months. That's right. And I suspect you're taking that step because it was what may May you came into the business? May of 2015, yes. So you've been in the business for a month or so yes. at this point in time, um, and you're seeking to understand the extent to which regulators have been interested in SWAN. Yes, I was aware generally of um, industry discussion around this topic, um, and was seeking some more specific information about that about the business. And you may recall a couple of days after this you had a meeting with Paul, is it Ayton? Yes. Um, you had a meeting with him on the 15th of June and you've said something about that in your statement. I don't need to take you to it. Um, but then on the... So, yes, yeah, so that, that was a follow-up meeting to my request for information. I yes, think. thank and you. I think that was what the um, note was referring to. Yes. Um, on the 17th of June, um, you sent an email to the group to group corporate affairs which you've also exhibited to your statement as exhibit 21 i might take you to it it's iag.502.002.0718 Um, and if we could go to 0733 on that page. Actually, I might, I might go back a little bit further. If we could go to 0736. I'll just show you the chain, yes. Mr Bessel, so you can orientate yourself with the discussion that was going on at the time. Um, you can see there that there's an email from Dennis Hang on the 3rd of June to an email group that, which is called the ASIC Working Group. Yes. And also CCing people including John Anning. Now, you can't tell from the redacted email address, but the ASIC Working Group is was an email address for the Insurance Council. Yes. Uh, it's not an IAG or a 
Swan email group. It's an insurance council email group. I can tell you that because I can see oh, okay. it. Okay. Can't. Yes. Okay. Um, and Mr. Or, sorry, Denise Hang is a employee of the insurance council. You can see that from the signature block. Yes. So this was an email where there was being an update provided to presumably a range of people, a range of companies that were members of the Insurance Council. Yes. Updating the members on various ASIC projects and other things. Yes. Um, but the first topic is updates on ASIC projects and you'll see the very first update is CCI. Yes. And then underneath that is insurance sold through car yards. Yes. So two topics of significant interest to SWAN. Yes. And then if we go over the page to 0735. <coughs> that email is then circulated, starts to be circulated within SWAN or within IAG perhaps by Mr Singh, who's the manager of public policy and industry affairs. Ms Singh. Oh, sorry, yes. Ms Singh. Yes. Pardon me. Um, and Ms Singh emails it to Mr Ayton and to... Jeffrey Harris. Yes. Um, and you can see the last line of the first paragraph. Ms Singh says, ASIC indicated that while this review has concluded, that being the CCI review, its interest in these product is, products is not expected to diminish. So I'm, I can't quite see where you are on the that, page. That, sorry. sorry. It's the last sentence of the paragraph oh, yes, that's you. just been exploded. Yes. And then um, the last yes. paragraph of that email says, Paul, can you please send through what we sent to ASIC for the car yards review? It would be good to understand what they're looking for in particular. Yes. Thank you. And then perhaps if that page could stay on the screen, but the next page, 0734, could be put next to it. Mr Ayton responds to Ms Singh, and you can see the second uh, paragraph, the bottom of the page, in respect to improving your understanding of what ASIC are looking for, in particular with the review of add-on insurance, the best way of achieving this would be for me to provide you with an overview of my initial discussions with ASIC and to take you through our response. With this being the case, don't hesitate to let me know when you'll be in Melbourne next and we'll see if we can find time in our schedules to cover this off. Yes. And I might have misunderstood you before. Mr. Ayton's signature block says Swan Insurance. That's right. And so he was the general manager of Swan. Yes, he was. At this point in time. At this point in time, yes, that's right. Thank you. <coughs> um, and then if we move to 0733, Can you see at the foot of the page there, Mr Ayton's emailed you? Yes. And you've said, thanks for your time this morning, and that's the reference to the meeting that I said to you that yes. you had with Mr Ayton on the 15th of June. Yes. Um, and the purpose of that meeting was, at least in part, to discuss ASIC's CCI review and <laughs> its add-on insurance review? Yes, I think it was re in reference to that earlier email where I asked... Um, for an, for an overview of, of activity that's going on within SWAN specific to those reviews. Thank you. And um, the email above that, a couple of days later, you've emailed Jane Anderson. Yes. And the last paragraph is, from my perspective, the process and engagement with ASIC is working well, and we support a review of add-on insurance in relation to motor dealers, the bulk of SWAN's business, particularly when it comes to commission structures. Yes. Um, when you speak there of the engagement with ASIC, yes. um, at this point in time at least, I think it's right to say the engagement was a with ASIC was principally through the Insurance Council. That's right. Uh, and SWAN uh, was, was a party to a working group effectively with the Insurance Council. Uh, and the engagement, it increased in the months following um, June of, that, of, of 2015. But an industry approach was one that was being 
um, supported by the industry participants in add-on and commission capping, for example, was something that was being discussed as well as some other benefit changes. Part of the problem here was I think that at least a significant number of the market participants acknowledged the fact that the commission structures were either inappropriate or not financially competitive for the product providers. Yes. But nobody was prepared to move first in reducing commission. No, and the view that we also expressed was that unless there was either industry reform, using commission as one example, that if, if one particular insurer decided to reduce commission, for example, that wouldn't necessarily improve the consumer's experience because the same issue may arise in other, in other, in, in other dealerships, for example, with other insurers. So the, the, the industry position was one that um, this, this matter needed to be dealt with holistically. By the industry as a whole? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, and then if we just move to finish off this email to the first page, which is 0730. Um, there's an email there from Mr Galanopoulos. Yes. And what was his role? So he was, I think at the time he was head of compliance, risking compliance within the Swan business. Thank you. Um, and he's emailing Zahid Evans. Yes. And can you see there the third paragraph? He says, however, through its work on the distribution of add-on insurance through car yards, ASIC was effectively looking at CCI sold through non-ADI intermediated channels. ASIC was concerned that insurers did not have adequate control over the issue of CCI or CCI variants. ASIC assured Swan that it would contact participating insurers to discuss its findings and its proposed recommendations before moving forward. A quick look at the note sent today indicates that this is still the case. John Anning's notes indicate that ASIC have developed a number of recommendations and would be discussing these with participating insurers over the next couple of months. Yes. And then the next paragraph, my perspective is that we should all take a deep breath and look at the issues in a measured but proactive manner simply regurgitating the longest of bows, i.e. the cash store and authorised intermediaries who are subject to a monitoring and surveillance regime doesn't assist. Involvement in the ICA conference called for 16 September is a good first step and I'd suggest that IAG Risk and Compliance and Corporate Affairs be a party to that forum. Yes. So still at this point in time very much directing attention to the issue through the ICA yes. and looking for an industry-wide issue. Yes. And Reflecting on the matter now, or at least at the time that you were preparing your witness statement, you formed the view that Swan tethering itself in the way that it did to the ICA was one of the causes for the delay in Swan directly addressing the issues? Yes, in, in hindsight, had, had Swan taken a view of its own, um, it may have dealt with some of the matters more proactively, and I've, I've referenced that in my statement. Um, I think at the time this industry approach was one that was, was generally supported across, across the industry. Um, commission capping, for example, was something that was seen as a very important issue and that, that ultimately um, led to a submission to the ACCC um, which, which ultimately was rejected. Um, but I think that was another example of the industry approach and, and, it, and, it, and it, as it turned out, commissions as an example, as it turned out that didn't, that didn't work. Thank you. Um, in September 2015, um, or at least by September 2015, IAG was aware that ASIC held serious concerns about add-on insurance products. Yes. It was aware that ASIC held concerns before that, but by September 2015, ASIC's concerns were clearly serious and perhaps more precise than they had been before. Yes, the, there was a, a meeting, and I think this, this email refers to a meeting or an upcoming meeting that the ICA had with its representatives. Um, and um, ASIC at that meeting had expressed frustration that 
the industry wasn't moving quickly enough. And that, that was in September of, of 2015. It was, and there's an, there's an email that I'll just show you. It's iag.502.002.0729. This confirms your recollection of September. You can see the email there. This is from you to Ms Singh. Yes. Um, this is Exhibit 20, 20 to your witness statement. Yes. And you say, ASIC advised at the ICA ASIC meeting on 8th of September 2015 that the review has identified long-standing concerns with pricing, value of products and commissions. Following the ASIC working group meeting yesterday, John Anning advised that he was quite concerned as he has not seen a regulator give the industry such a dressing down in years. Yes. So certainly by this point in time, it was plain as day that ASIC had very serious concerns about these products. Yes. And ASIC had been looking into these products for some time. Yes. Um, around the same time, you might recall, um, Ms Singh acknowledged in an email to ASIC that many of IAG's consumer credit insurance products had not kept pace with social change and technological developments. Do you remember that? Yes. I it's do. in an email that you've annexed as um, Exhibit 16 to your yes. witness statement. And do you agree with that statement? Yes. Thank you. You've said in your statement that on the 18th of December 2015, it was on the 18th of December 2015 that IAG was aware that the sale of Swan add on insurance products through motor vehicle dealers may have contravened regulatory requirements. Yes. Um, why do you say that it was on the 18th of December 2015? So, so that, was, that was in specific reference to a meeting that took place with ASIC in December, on the 18th of December. Um, Ms Singh was, uh, uh, attended that meeting there, there were some other IAG representatives as well. I wasn't at that meeting. But um, that was the first time that we had obtained um, or been provided a view from ASIC that there may be some more particular issues to address within SWAN specifically. Up until that point, the conversations were very much an industry focus. But in that meeting, there was specific <coughs> reference to SWAN. And, and that was the reference in my statement where we became, so IAG became more aware that SWAN was raised specifically as opposed to an industry issue in that, in that meeting. Is it fair to say that notwithstanding from at least 2013, uh, IAG was aware that there was interest by ASIC in consumer credit products? Yes. And um, over time that interest became an interest more broadly in add-on insurance products? Yes. Um, and although it knew by September that ASIC's concerns were very serious, uh, what SWAN did was engage through the Insurance Council and it didn't take any proactive steps to investigate the products or the sales techniques within its own business at that point in time. My, my view now is that, that yes, that's the case, that, that the industry approach was one that was preferred and not, not a proactive approach specific to its own business practice. There was nothing that would have stopped SWAN adhering to an industry approach insofar as engagement with ASIC was concerned, but also doing a review of its own business to try and ascertain if there were problems and if so, what those problems were. No, I think, I think in hindsight there was a great deal of emphasis on this issue of c capping of commission. Um, and I think the concern was if someone was to reduce commission first, as we mentioned, that, that, that would lose business. And I think commission was seen as almost the, the, the first priority rather than some of these other product issues we've discussed. Um, and I think, I think that was why the industry approach was, was seen as preferable at the time. And early on in your evidence yesterday, you agreed with me that Swan was concerned to be maintaining its market share in the period 2013 to 2016. Yes. And maintaining market share was not possible with a unilater unilateral action to decrease commissions. That's right. Yes. And, and for context, um, we, 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 I did mention that we sold the business, uh, the motor vehicle business in August. 
Um, we had signed the first contract in June of that year and received the first non-binding offer in October of, of 2015. Uh, and I'm sure that, that also um, played a part in... It wasn't going to be your issue in the long run? Well, it was. It was, certainly was because... And we continue to um, work with ASIC on, on matters that we are continuing to work with ASIC on. But for context at the time, I think that may have also been another reason that the industry approach was one that was more preferable. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and do something considered brave in this commission, Mr Bessel, and take you to a spreadsheet. Um, it's IAG.511.009.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.
well and truly underway at that point in time. Thank you. Um, can I take you now to IAG.503.006.11 This is a report for the IAG Risk Committee. And you'll see when it comes up, it's headed Review of Consumer Credit Insurance and Add-on Insurance Products Distributed Through Swan Insurance. Now, it's dated the 27th of July 2015, but that is a dating error. Yes. It, this document is, in fact, from the 27th of July 2016. I'm aware of that, You yes. agree with that? Thank yes. you. Um, and if I could take you to the second page, 1157. can see at the start the internal review of CCI and add-on insurance products distributed through Swan Insurance has been completed simultaneously with the ASIC review of Swan on the same products and distribution channel. Yes. And then you can see the nature of distribution through motor dealer channel is inherently complex. That's the start of the second paragraph. Yes. Strong competition. Yes. High commission arrangements, yes. where unregulated, the non-CCI products, and additional financial partnership support arrangements. That includes the marketing payments that I took you to yesterday. Yes. Notwithstanding ASIC's focus on specific products that, when viewed independently, provide minimal financial return to the consumer, using loss ratio as a proxy, the overall channel does not meet IAG's target RORBC. What's that? Return on risk-based capital. Thank you. Targets when the loss-making comprehensive motor portfolio is included. Yes. And then if that box could come down, and then there is a heading ICA working party, second last heading on that page. Yes. Um, and it notes the ICA working party is due to submit to ASIC by the end of July. It's anticipated that the final initiatives detailed in this submission will address the issues identified in this review. And then it says, to avoid putting Swan out of step with the rest of the market, which may result in them being at a competitive disadvantage for the remaining motorcycle channel, it has been agreed to defer the implementation of the recommendations from this review until the ICA submission is received and hopefully accepted by ASIC. Yes. Once ASIC response to the ICA submission is determined, a detailed action plan including delivery dates will be agreed with SWAN. Yes. And that's a paragraph that <coughs> bears out the strategy and concerns that you've been expressing that this needed to be a whole of market move or it was going to be to the detriment of the business. Yes. And even though SWAN here was moving out of the motor vehicle side of the business, yes. it still needed to preserve its motorcycle market share at this point in time? Yes, at this point in time, that's right. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, I think, that the motorcycle channel was much more reliant on comprehensive insurance than add-on yes. compared to the motor vehicle channel. Um, and at this stage, we still had that motorcycle, cha uh, mo motorcycle business, yes. Yes, thank you. And then if we go over the page to 1158, Can you see their observation too? Commission levels for non-regulated add-on insurance products are uncapped yes. and as high as 50% in some cases. It's acknowledged that SWAN has been lobbying ASIC for some time to regulate commission for add-on insurance products. Yes. Um, Then if we could go to 1162, please. Can you see observation seven there? IAG has limited governance over the sales practices of add-on insurance products through car dealers. Yes. 
I think you've now accepted that that is the case and was the case at least from 2013? Yes. And then finally, if we could move to 1164 of that document. <coughs> Observation 10 is that a detailed review of each product's policy wording was not completed during this review. Yes. The scope of the review did not include a deep technical review of all the products distributed by Swan through motor dealers. As a result, it's not known if each of these products provides sufficient benefit to consumers aligning to IAG's consumer-led data-driven purpose of we help make your world a safer place. Yes. So even at um, July 2016, Swan didn't yet, and IAG didn't yet have a handle on the extent of any product design issues but it was well aware of the sales channel issues. Yes, that's right. Thank and, you. and that was at about the same time that we started to look at these things more broadly across the group in the, in the context of product design. Yes, yes, well, I might come back to that a little later. Um, it was about a little after this that IAG then proposed a remediation program to ASIC Later, later that year. I think yes. it was in August. Yes. Does that sound familiar to you? Um, and then there was a fairly lengthy negotiation between SWAN or IAG and ASIC about the extent of any remediation program. Yes. Actually, the, I think in August, um, the dialogue between IAG and ASIC was specific to two particular matters that they raised with two particular products as opposed to the broader remediation that discussions that took place later on. So in August it was specific to two areas and then that became a broader scope Thank you. later on that year. Commissioner, I'll tender that document. Report of IAG Risk Committee Review CCI and Add-on Insurance 27 July 16, uh, IAG 503 006 Exhibit 6.314. Um, it was the 12th of September when ASIC released report 492. Yes. Are you familiar with that report? I am. Yes. Um, and on the next day, the 13th of September, Mr. Kell, the Deputy Chairman of ASIC, sent a copy of the report to Elizabeth Bryan, who was IAG's chair. Yes, that's right. And you deal with that in paragraph 63 of your statement, and you've exhibited that letter. Yes. And I might just briefly take you to that. It's Exhibit 172, which is IAG.500.105.503. So this is the email to IAG's chair. Yes. Um, and it encloses a copy of ASIC's report 492. Yes. And Mr Kell says to Ms Bryan that the purpose of the letter is to ensure that you're aware of the need for systemic and substantial changes to the way these add-on products are designed, priced and sold to consumers and to seek your response yes. to the findings of our review and to set out the consequences for insurers who seek to avoid or subvert the benefits intended to be delivered to consumers through price-related initiatives developed through the Insurance Council of Australia and Gilbert and Tobin. Yes. And then if we go over the page to 0578, there's the heading at the bottom, insurers have been on notice. Yes. Mr Kell says insurers have been on notice of ASIC's concerns in relation to poor practices in the sale of add-on insurance for several years. The cash store case, are you familiar with what's being spoken of yeah, there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Highlighted that ASIC will take enforcement action where we see accept unacceptable practices in the sale of such products. As at February 2014 ICA Annual Regulatory Forum, I have announced that ASIC was reviewing products in this market in my speech. Our concerns were also set out in detail in ASIC Report 471, the sale of life insurance through car dealers 
taking consumers for a ride as they relate to life insurance. Yes. Moreover, insurers have been fully aware of the poor outcomes for consumers for many years through their own internal data in relation to premiums, claims and commissions. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. We are concerned about the time taken by insurers to respond to these long-standing concerns about the sale of these products to consumers given the identified detrimental outcomes. Yes. And you've exhibited a letter in response from Ms Bryan to yes. that email. Yes. Uh, sorry, to that letter. Yes. And in her response, which is Exhibit 174 of your statement, uh, Ms Bryan said that the IAG board had been kept informed of ASIC's concerns. Yes. And that the IAG board was overseeing the steps to be taken in addressing unacceptable outcomes for Swan's customers. Yes. Thank you. And you also wrote to Mr Kell on the same day, I think, the 26th yes. of September. Yes, I did. And what caused you to write to Mr Kell? So the Mr Kell's letter was, was quite lengthy and our chair responded directly to him, which was the letter that you were referring to, and I provided a more detailed response um, on our chair's behalf which listed more specific activity that we're undertaking. Thank you. Um, ASIC wrote to Swan then, if I skip forward a little bit, um, to the, sorry, ASIC wrote to Swan on the 12th of May the following year, 2017. Yes. And it identified 32 issues across five products. Yes. That ultimately became the framework for the design of the resolution program. That's right. This is the more detailed letter that I think you were referring to earlier. Yes. Um, and you've exhibited that to your statement. It's uh, Exhibit 187. Um, how involved was IAG in Swan's negotiations in respect of the resolution program? Heav heavily involved in that. And why was it that IAG was heavily involved in that? So I took a view, as did the, the broader group, that towards the end of 2016, following this letter being uh, sent by Mr Kell, uh, that we needed more formal engagement with ASIC to bring these matters to resolution. So I engaged uh, members of the corporate affairs in our group legal area and ultimately that group formed a, effectively a, a working group, working party that then uh, worked with ASIC over the course of effectively the next 12 months until such time as we finalised that resolution program. Thank you. Um, you've said in your witness statement that Swan operated under a devolved business model. Yes. What's a devolved business model? So in the, in the context um, of these discussions, Swan had its own AFSL. Uh, it had its own management structures, its own regal, sorry, legal and risk and compliance functions. So it was effectively a standalone business. So that's the reference to devolved. It, it, it didn't have any shared services, if you like, with the group until very late um, in 2015, early 2016. It was effectively a standalone business. It was still part of the division that ultimately I looked after for that period of time, but it was effectively self-sufficient. The person with ultimate responsibility for the Swan business was the head of the division that it sat in within IAG? Yes. And at all times from 2013, members of Swan's board included IAG's chair? Uh, I'd, I'd have to check that, I'm not sure. All right. Um, are you aware that at all times since 2013, IAG CEO was a member of the Swan Board? I believe so, yes. Did the Swan Board meet and have formal functions, or was that not the way I'd, governance I'd, worked within the Swan unit? I, I don't know exactly. Um, I wasn't on that board, and so I, I can't answer that question. All right. Um, I just want to turn briefly to the remediation program before coming to some questions on a different topic. Um, on the 19th of December 2017, ASIC announced that IAG would remediate 67,960 customers. Yes. And the estimated cost of the remediation program at that stage was $39 million. Yes. And 
you've said in your statement that the remediation program will in fact cost a little less than that. In your statement, you said $37.1 million. Yes, that's right. And um, part of the reason, no doubt, for that is that rather than 67,960 customers, there will in fact be, on your estimate, 64,187 yes, that will right. be remediated. Yes. And in its media release, which I might just go to RCD.0014. 0051-0232. Um, ASIC <clears throat> said that the program would include refunds for seven different types of issue. Do yes. you remember that? Yes. And that document will come up in a moment, but the issues that are identified in um, that document are where it's unlikely the customer could claim as the insured value of the car was more than the amount borrowed. Yes. And you say in your statement that 1,935 policyholders are affected by that issue? Yes. Thank you. Um, that's li sorry, that's listed in a table, I think. In, is that the table that's in my I, statement? I think if you go to paragraph 40 of your statement, you'll see some explanation of I have, it. I have that here. Yes, I, I see that table. Yes. So I think I'm correctly attributing the issue to the number, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. The second category was that gap cover unnecess was unnecessary as it duplicated existing customer held by the policyholder under a comprehensive policy. Yes. And there are about 127 people that fell into that. Yes. The third category was customers who were sold a more expensive level of cover than they needed. Yes. Um, and that's the largest single category by number. Yes. 41,039 policyholders. Yes. Fourth category was customers who did not receive rebates under gap cover policies when they paid out their loan early, even though the policy had ended. Yes. And that's another large category, 13,527. Yes. The fifth category was customers who were sold MBI. Yes for longer than they needed? Yes. Can you explain that issue? Uh, this was to do with the mechanical breakdown insurance, That's I believe, right. or the warranty insurance. So they may have purchased a policy um, that had an option which normally related to the number of kilometres travelled. Yes. So someone may have purchased a vehicle, for example, that had so many kilometres on it, and they've purchased a policy that effectively expired when the kilometres were reached in a shorter period of time after the policy was un purchased. Yes. That's my understanding of that matter. Thank you. That's the fifth category, and just so you know, Mr Vessel, that document's now on the screen. Yes. And I'm taking the description of the categories from uh, the front page of this document. Yes. You can see the second list of bullet points. The program includes refunds where? Yes. And I've just read to you, in effect, the third last bullet point. Which I think I answered correctly. Which you just explained. Yes. Yes. Um, the sixth category was customers who paid twice for roadside assistance because they were sold that option under two different policies that were in force at the same time. Yes. And there were 31 people in that category. Yes. And there's a final category, life insurance cover was sold to young people who are unlikely to need it. Yes. And you haven't included that category in this table. Um, you deal with that category in the paragraph below. Under the table, That's yes. right, in yes. 41. Yes. And there were 6,556 policyholders aged under 30 who were affected by that issue. Yes. Um, and so SWAN is in the process of remediating those identified customers. Yes. Why, to your mind, was it that customers were sold products that fell into one of the categories that I've just taken you to now? What were the causes? I think it was a combination of product design and customers not fully understanding the products that were being purchased and the environment in which those, those products were sold. Thank you.
Um, IAG commenced paying refunds to the affected customers on the 30th of January this year. Yes, that's right. And it expects to have completed the remediation by the 31st of January next year? Yes, we're, we, we seem to be about halfway through that. We've paid approximately $20 million uh, so far to about 30 odd thousand customers. Thank you. Um, Mr Bessel, do you agree that a significant number of the add-on insurance products sold by Swan were of questionable or little value to the consumer? Yes, I agree that in many cases consumers purchased products that were of little or no value to them. We, we, we do know that there are cases that consumers did obtain good and fair value, but in many cases they did not. Do you agree that the products were poorly designed from a consumer pers perspective? I think, I think the products could have been better explained in product documentation. So, yeah, I would, yes, I'd answer that question. Well, explanation is one factor. Yes. Um, and it is true that even a well-designed product, if not properly explained, could be problematic to the consumer. Yes. But well, is there a more fundamental issue with the inherent design of the product? I think many of the products in their own right were, were appropriate. How, how they were sold and perhaps the details and how they were communicated were more, more of the issue. Do you think it's the case that for many people, if they had a life insurance policy, perhaps through their superannuation fund, yes. and if they had a comprehensive policy of motor vehicle insurance, there was little need for them to have any of these policies? In, in, in many cases, that's true. What we've seen through the um, resolution program so far, and those 60 odd thousand customers I referred to, the bulk of the refunds that we are providing relates to uh, effectively over insurance as opposed to um, duplicate insurance. So um, yeah, I, th I think there, there are occasions where insurance was purchased as, that was not required, but actually what we're seeing over insurance was the predominant issue so far. And over insurance necessarily means, doesn't it, if you're not capable of claiming that the products of low value to the consumer? Yes, or the, or the consumer purchased a level of cover that was not was not needed. Yes. They needed a level that was here and they purchased a higher level, yes. Do you think that the principal reasons for the conduct occurring were some of these? I'll put a variety of them to you and you can tell me which you accept and which you don't. That these policies were sold by authorised representatives with no effective supervision by SWAN? No, I don't, I don't agree with that that Swan was selling the products at a time when it was focused on profit and market share? Yes, I agree. That Swan viewed its motor vehicle dealers as its customers? Yes. Swan didn't develop products based on the needs of consumers? Yes. Develop the products based on, if anything, the needs of the motor vehicle dealers? Yes. And you also said in your statement that IAG's devolved business model gave Swan operational autonomy and provided insufficient visibility within IAG of the risks of SWAN? Yes. Do you think that overstates the degree of autonomy SWAN had? No, I think that's a fair reflection on, on what was occurring at the time. At any point, but at any point in time, it was capable of IAG finding out exactly what was going on in SWAN. It just didn't do it. Yes. It didn't do it because of the devolved business model, you say? Yes, and, and I think, again, this is a hindsight view. At the time, SWAN represented uh, less than 10% of the overall revenue for the business. And again, on reflection, I think the size of the business and the devolved model created an environment where, where proactive oversight was not undertaken. Was it wrong for SWAN to incentivise its authorised representatives in the way that it did? So my view on that is that the, the incentives that were in place were in line with market. They were not out of step with market conditions. H having said that, they are, they are high. And they're not just high, but they are incentives given to authorised representatives whose very business model means that they 
need to supplement their core income with additional income, such as by the sale of insurance products. Yes. And Swan incentivised the authorised representative personally. Yes. And incentivised at least some of the authorised representative's staff. Yes. Um, and uh, the authorised representatives were professional salespeople that had yes. managed to convince a person to buy a car already. Yes. And had then signed them up to a finance package and then presented them with six or so other add on insurance products they wanted to sell. Yes. And there was usually no direct financial consequence felt by the consumer as a result of taking the add on insurance because it was wrapped into the finance package. That's that right. On, on, on most occasions, that's right, yes. Thank you. Now, is Swan still in the motorcycle add on insurance market? No, it's not. It exited in October of last year. All right. Well, it does still sell comprehensive motorcycle insurance. Thank though. you. Um, that, Mr Bessel, puts you in a perhaps unique position in that you have long insurance and in, sorry, long experience in the insurance industry, including in respect of add-on insurance, but you're no longer responsible for a business that is involved in these products or that issues them. That's right. Um, and you're well aware of the many and varied issues in this market that ASIC has identified. Yes. And do you think that IAG formed the view that it was just too hard to fix these issues on its own? And once the ACCC had rejected the commission capping proposal, it was too hard to fix these issues market-wide? I think that combined with the fact that we, were, we as a group, were taking a view around customer um, and, and the, the way in which products are constructed and customer value. So I think the combination of an internal group view um, around the customer centricity of products, to use that term, with, in this case, the external market environment, um, led us to believe that leaving this market was, was aligned with our, what was going to be our strategy. I, IAG has got product design principles now in place for its products? Yes, it has. And these add-on products wouldn't meet those standards now? No, they would not. Um, so now that you're no longer involved in the market, I'm going to ask you some questions to see if you can give assistance to the Commission in dealing with some of the more knotty problems that are faced in this market. Yes. Um, one suggestion for reform in this area is that add-on insurance should be sold only under a deferred sale model. Are you aware of that? I've, I've, I'm feeling with, the, with that recommendation or, or the suggestion. I, the idea behind that recommendation is that consumers would have a period of, t period of time um, where they could consider if the product was appropriate and met their needs. Yes. And they would be able to take that time outside of what might be a high-pressure sales environment where they've already agreed to sign on to a car and a finance package. Yes. Do you think that that is a good proposal? Yes, I do. The um, products that Swan used to sell did have a cooling off period within them, but I think a more formalised uh, model that you're referring to would, would be appropriate. An important aspect for a deferred sales model to work would be the quality and comprehensibility of the product information provided to the consumer. Yes. Has IAG, in the course of its redesign of its products and its philosophy, given any consideration as to how to best convey to consumers the key terms and exclusions of policies? I'd say that's an ongoing process. I don't believe we have reached the ideal model yet, yet, but I think a combination of plain and simple language in product disclosure statements as well as um, appropriate follow-up and dialogue as a theme is important. Uh, I note recently um, there's some there's some sur a survey has been reported on that suggests lots of material that is available isn't isn't read or used by the consumer. Mm. So I think that's still a work in progress. But I think simplified product disclosure statements and a more proactive approach w would assist. Um, that deferred sales model coupled with more effective disclosure information is one method. Another method might just be to accept the fact that there are inherent problems in these add-on insurance products that are incapable of fixing because they are inherent in the product yes. and to stop the products being sold? Yes. Would that be something that would be of more utility to consumers in your view? I, 
I wouldn't like to speak on behalf of a consumer because I'm sure there are consumers that see these products are of value. But um, I think that's an example, and I'd, I'd have to defer to consumer advocacy groups to that point, uh, and I know we're certainly engaging with them. Um, so it's, that one's a bit hard for me to comment on because it's a consumer view. Well, do you think that there is, at the end of the day, on a proper analysis, are these products of sufficient value to a sufficient number of consumers to warrant them being in the market? I think, I think if they're structured structured differently, differently, they could be of greater value. In terms of price, and for example, so I think um, so. If I reflect on the <coughs> high level of commission, for example, that we've talked about, that ultimately is embedded in a in a price point in in some way or form. So I think if things like commissions are capped, um, product disclosure statements are more easily understood. Some of the benefit periods are perhaps extended or even. Um, re removed from a policy. I think there are a combination of factors there that would, would ensure there is greater value for a, for a consumer. Thank you. You won't have read it, but QBE, who was one of Swan's competitors in this market yes. and is also in a remediation program yes. for add-on insurance, has supplied a statement to the Royal Commission, which I'll tender once you leave the witness box. Um, QBE identifies one of the principal reasons for its conduct being that these products were sold under a general advice model. Yes. And um, QBE says that under that model, it was inappropriate to determine whether, for the authorised representative to determine whether the policy was suitable for the personal circumstances of the consumer. Mm. Is that something that there has been discussion of within SWAN or IAG? Not SWAN, but that, that matter generally has been discussed, but, it, but it not, in, not in the context of the, of the SWAN operation. Does the general insurance model present difficulties in ensuring that consumers are given, sorry, are sold products that are suitable to them? The, the, the difference between general and personal advice is something that's discussed a lot in the industry. Um, and that, that matter also goes to the channel through which the product is, is purchased, whether it's directly or through an advisor. And obviously there's different implications for the consumer through those channels. I think it's an ongoing discussion within the industry um, and will we'll be an ongoing discussion for some time. I think the, the general advice and personal advice model has its place. Um, is it perfect? I, no, I don't think it is. Thank you, Mr Bessel. Commissioner, I have no further questions. Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, there's no re-examination, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bessel. You may step down. Yes, Mr. Costello. Um, Commissioner, there is a further witness statement. It's a supplementary witness statement of Mark Miller of IAG in answer to rubric 651 and 653, dated the 14th of September 2018. I wish to tender. The uh, document ID is WIT.0001.0167.0001. That statement becomes Exhibit 6.315. Commissioner, as I just mentioned to Mr Bessel, Mr Declan Moore of QBE has also provided the Commission with a witness statement in answer to rubric 6.59 on the issue of add-on insurance. The statement is dated the 30th of August 2018 and its document ID is QBE.9999.0002. Exhibit 6.316. Commissioner, um, if we could adjourn for five minutes so that the bar table could be reconstituted. So if I come back at 11. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. <coughs>